Welcome to another important stage of the planning process. A word that brings fear to any university student's ears. Budgeting. As you can imagine, planning the cost for a project is not a simple job. There are plenty of questions a project manager needs to ask and get answers to. What financial resources do they need to create the deliverables? Are there going to be additional expenses? Will they need monetary buffers for any tasks? When do they need the money? Where will it come from? What is the total budget? Who will control the costs? How? Plus more, obviously. But what's the best way to answer these questions? You got it. A detailed project budget. Conveniently, building one of these follows a similar process to building a project schedule. First, identify the activities that cost money from your work breakdown structure or activity list. Then, estimate the cost of each work package, task and deliverable, add buffers, and account for uncertainties. At that point, you should be ready to time the expenses. This can be done using a Gantt chart. And finally, put it all together into a project budget. But before we dive into the process of building said budget, there's something to note. Budgets are often exceeded because just like Jimmy's timekeeping, spending habits fall prey to the optimism bias. So yet again, the project manager has to go beyond her or his natural instincts and plan a budget with sufficient breadth and depth. They must account for every part of the project that could potentially cost money and estimate how much money as accurately as humanly possible. Next lesson, we'll go through this process and see how to avoid any pitfalls. See you there, project manager. The first step of cost planning is identifying all cost generating activities. I'm sure you don't need to be told at this point that if anything is missed, then it will immediately affect the project budget. So let's go to the Lamborari project and have a look at how you could approach this part of the process. The best thing to do now is whip out your work breakdown structure and activity list. Let's have a closer look at the three main work streams we have, shall we? Starting with the showroom preparation stream. We can safely assume that Lamborari doesn't have a construction team on payroll and will have to hire at least one specialized company. You need to negotiate with various vendors and you also need to evaluate if there are any costs that won't be covered by their company, like clearing or prepping the land prior to building. You must ask if the company will pay for material costs or will you have to buy your own paint? A detailed contract listing the services the vendor will provide must be drawn up and factored into the project budget along with additional costs that you have identified. Regarding car preparation, Lamborari's core business is producing cars, so there will be no financial payments for the production. However, car costs do need to be documented as the cars still need to be accounted for. The way you do this depends on the company. Some companies require transactions between departments to be made through intercompany expenses. You need the project sponsor to advise how to fact the cost. Of course, the internal structure of the company plays a big part here, so communicating with the appropriate people is paramount. Not only that, but you have to identify all related activities that generate cost. Delivery, car testing, insurance, things like that. Now, on to staff preparation. Working with the HR department is crucial here. You need to establish how many staff members are needed, what jobs they will have, what costs will be incurred for recruitment. Will Lamborari use their own HR department? Or will they pay for services of an HR company? And then you need to consider training. Will you train internally or hire a company again? Will you interview and train on site? or rent an external training center. There is plenty to think about here, but if you have built a detailed and extensive activity list, then identifying which ones incur costs should be a lot easier. Bear in mind, however, that the cost planning may bring to light tasks that you did not think of while planning the project schedule. All right, 
Now that we have an extensive list of all our activities that will incur costs, it's time to estimate what those costs will be. Non-straightforward processes can rear their head here. Some tasks, like buy paint, are simple to estimate, and tasks which you may have estimated during a previous project, like using a particular HR company, can be worked out with little resistance. However, with other items, you may have to combine the information you have available with professional estimations from your team. Sometimes you have to negotiate with vendors too. No doubt, some of these can take days or even weeks if many different people need to be contacted. As mentioned, using information from past projects or activities by the organization is a very useful tactic at this stage in particular. And of course, don't forget about the optimism bias and adding buffers. Once all your cost generating activities have their costs estimated, it's time to work out when the money needs to be spent and concurrently acquired. Use your Gantt chart to plan this, and then put it all together in your project budget, which could look something like this. It's important to track your actual spending, so adding a column for that would make sense. But with so many different types of project, there is no one-size-fits-all project budget template. Check out the course resources for a few more examples to get a better idea. But remember, it is the job of the project manager to compile a project budget that works best for their project. Resource procurement is one of the more volatile areas of budgeting, as the project manager will be working with external vendors, and as a result they will be faced with a greater level of uncertainty. Next lesson, we're going to talk about what the project manager may be faced with when procuring resources, and how they can better prepare themselves. See you there. It's often the case that an organization will not have the required resources that a project needs. Therefore, the project manager here has the responsibility to procure what they need externally. By this point, they should be very familiar with the details of the contract in order to properly assess the costs and the risks of any transaction. They must be aware of timelines, due dates, and quality levels of all resources they are procuring. There are three main types of contract that we will run through now. It is up to the project manager to find the best contract because it's their main tool for keeping track of vendor work and behavior. So the first one is called fixed price, and it's the simplest type of contract. The vendor commits to doing the work for a set amount within a certain time frame. The pros of this is that any additional spending will be taken on by the vendor. No risk for you. Perfect. Or is it? You see that they are aware that with this kind of contract, if the costs are higher than expected, then they will incur losses. Therefore, there is a chance they will put a big buffer on the initial price. Or if they find that costs are getting too high, they may try to decrease the scope or the quality in order to compensate. So know that this is beneficial to use when the scope is clear to all parties but a good analysis is important prior to making agreements. The second type is called cost plus. This is where the buyer agrees to pay any cost incurred by the vendor performing the work. This can be a fixed additional fee, a variable fee, or a mix of the two. Either way, it gives the buyer the flexibility to adapt the spending in accordance with the work being done. But with that comes the risk of covering all extra costs along with the chance that the vendor may keep the work going longer than needed, or adding extra items to the to-do list. This contract makes more sense if the scope is not easy to define, but proper controls need to be put in place to ensure money is only spent on things essential for the project. A fancy new haircut for the vendor doesn't fall into this category. The third type of contract is called time and materials, and it's a mixture of fixed price and cost plus. It's where the vendor charges the buyer an hourly or daily rate. For example, when consultants or technicians charge per day for their services. It's another good contract to jump into when the scope is not clear, and the work is more labor-based than material-based. 
It runs a similar risk to the cost plus contract, but that just means the same countermeasures can be taken. Well, there we have three types of contract, but there can be many variations, and of course they can all be tailor-made. The project manager could add incentives for the vendor to complete work faster or to a better quality. The contract can even include inflation if the project spans a long time. The project manager must have a good understanding of all risks and benefits that each agreement can have. Then define the most convenient approach for the project, the stakeholders, and of course for the vendor themselves to agree. Awesome. So that's how the project manager can deal with the financial side of things. But what about the non-financial resources? Well, join us next lesson where we'll talk about human resources. See you there. It's not all about the money in project management, so forget about the price tag. Well, for this lesson at least. Because here we're going to discuss the non-financial resources that will be needed for a project. Primarily, non-financial resources are humans, so that's what we're going to focus on now, human resources. Right, let's cut to the chase. It's time for another analysis. There are four parts to it. First, you define the type of resources. Then, you estimate how much time you will need. Thirdly, you validate the availability of the people you need. And lastly, you assign roles and responsibilities to them. As project manager, the first thing you should do is take your work breakdown structure as you have before and understand what kind of support is needed to execute the project. Whether the experts you need are external or already employed in the organization, this is the time to identify them. One thing to note is that management effort should also be accounted for. Many make the mistake that management are available by default. But if your analysts have worked to the bone to finish their work by the deadline only to have the management approval delayed because you haven't allocated the two days needed to check the work, then not only will you have some unhappy analysts, but you have also pushed back your entire project. Managers are busy people, and they will not always have the time in their schedule, unless you plan for it. The second part of the process is the estimations. You need to estimate the time each expert needs to dedicate to complete each of the activities. And don't forget your optimism bias and adding buffers. The tactics and charts we have used so far translate nicely to this area too. The next two parts we will cover in the next lessons, as they get a little more complex. After all, we are dealing with people who have varying schedules and workloads. So I'll see you there. Now that you've worked out who you need and how much time they need to dedicate to your magnificent project, you must work out when they can give you their time. The first thing you should do is create a schedule using a simple template. Just detail who needs to do what and when. Of course, you need to keep your calendar at hand for this part. It's important to keep track of employees' schedules. You also need to obtain confirmation from their department heads as there is a chance they will need them at certain times or refuse outright to let you have them, in which case you will need to work with the project sponsor to find an alternative plan. You also mustn't forget to check their personal availability, including any planned holidays. You can't expect people to send you important emails while they're enjoying their time at the beach. Let's go back to the showroom example. I'll zoom in to the work stream for the development of the software for the interactive to plays of your showroom. This is how creating a schedule works. First, we add columns for the name of the task, the person responsible and the expected duration. Then, we add a calendar with the month and weekdays. Do not forget to check for holidays and mark them. For example, in the US, the 4th of July is a national holiday. After that, we can mark the days, or weeks, when the person is not available to work on the project tasks. Finally, 
For an extra level of detail, you can add the amount of time that the person responsible can dedicate to the project tasks in each cell. And yes, this is quite similar to our favorite, the Gantt chart. So after we filled in the details, we can see in this work stream there are two developers, Steve and Terry. John, on the other hand, is responsible for the whole IT delivery and will be managing and coordinating their work. Monica has been appointed to do software testing, and every few days she will need to test the created software and provide feedback. This shouldn't be a problem to manage with this schedule, but we'll admit that it's not the most high-level way of organizing it, especially with large numbers of employees. A good idea is to clearly define everyone's roles and responsibilities. So that's what we'll do in the next lesson. Our last step is to define the roles and the responsibilities of all project team members. Having an easy to follow list of everyone involved in the project and their responsibilities is incredibly useful and will make the project run much more smoothly. I will now show you two fantastic tools used for documenting roles and responsibilities. The first one is a simple list like this one. Easy enough, right? Each person has a clear set of tasks so everyone can see who is responsible for what. The second tool is called an RACI matrix. It is slightly more complex, but it's easier to see who is involved with a particular task. According to the matrix, there are four roles for each task. R, A, C, and I. The first is responsible. The person who is directly responsible for doing the work. Second is accountable. The person responsible for meeting the overall goal of the activity, with the project manager being accountable for most things. Third, we have consulted. The person who provides information, expertise, or support for an activity. The fourth is informed. The person who needs to be informed on the progress of an activity, such as the project sponsor who must be kept up to date with the project health. Each tool has its benefits. The first being a high level look, which is very practical and quick to create. It is people oriented and shows who does what. The RACI, on the other hand, is perhaps a more formal document, but it highlights the tasks and shows much more information about who is involved in a particular activity or work stream. As always, the project manager must pick the method that best suits their project, type of tasks, and people involved. It could be one, or the other, or a mixture of the two. Now, there is just one more thing that can affect the trio of constraints. Quality checks. Whatever the goal of the project, it must reach quality standards. So we're going to look in the next lesson at how the project manager will define these standards and how they're kept throughout the project. I'll see you there. The standard of something as measured against other things of a similar kind. The degree of excellence of something. That's how the Cambridge Dictionary defines quality. But what do we mean when we talk about quality in the context of project management? We can think of quality as the qualitative characteristics of a product, be it its physical qualities like its material or contents, its performance like the acceleration of a vehicle, or service related such as response time in a customer facing role. The project manager will need to work with stakeholders to specify the quality standards of the deliverables of the project, and of course, to ensure they are being met. To do this, there is a wonderful five-step process to follow. A list always helps us to remember. So first, the project manager and the stakeholders must define the quality standards and requirements, adhering to any laws and regulations. For example, building a bridge will require different quality standards than building a website. A bridge would need rigorous strength testing, specific materials, and special construction methods. While a website would require all coding to be accurate, copy to be proofread, no broken links, and hopefully an aesthetically pleasing design. Of course, 
The project manager needs to identify and factor all criteria that the deliverables need to meet and how the specific project work must be executed to ensure standards are met. However, depending on the project, the project manager may need a department or external company to take responsibility for quality aspects. This will, without a doubt, involve non-straightforward tasks, as there will be multiple people to engage with and approvals to be collected before standards can be finalised. The second part of the process focuses on setting the actual and actionable targets for the criteria identified during step one. Let's have a look at a few different fields and see how targets are set. Field number one, construction. As you can imagine, most of the numerous quality standards are set by regulation and therefore require special expertise to be properly managed. These are things like structural stability, fire safety, air ventilation, drainage, electrical safety, quality of materials, plus so many more. Without these regulations met, the project is unlikely to get the required authorization documents. Field number two, production. A common way to set targets in production is to look at defect rate. Say a company is producing 100,000 units a month and sets targets of less than 50 defected units per month. A 0.05% tolerance, our target. Of course, Testing all 100,000 units would cost far too much time and money. So what companies usually do is to lean on statistical methods. A common example is to define a sample of units to be tested, say 1,000 units, and then set a tolerance level, for example, a maximum of 0.05% defective products. This means out of the 1,000 tested, no more than five products should have defects. Field number three. Customer service. If a company decides to outsource its call center to an external company, then to ensure customers are happy, they may decide to set a customer service quality target. For example, less than 5% of calls lost per month, or over 98% of cases resolved. The company may even decide to perform customer surveys after each call, asking the customers to rate their care they have received from one to five, with an average target of four or more. That makes sense, right? Okay, so after steps one and two have been completed, the third step of the process is to plan how and when to measure quality and who will do it. The project manager and the stakeholders need to agree on how quality audits will be performed once the project moves into execution. For example, this can include things like deciding on the total number of audits, the frequency of the checks and how the results will be reported. Project manager and stakeholders need to decide on an owner of the quality checks and if there is no appropriate employee within the organization, then they must seek external experts. All right, moving on to step four, finalizing the quality plan. Now, the project manager takes all the information gained so far and collates it into a simple table. The table should show the quality standards, a metric for each standard, the target result, sample size of audits, the frequency of reports, and the owner. Once all of this is done and dealt with, the final thing for the project manager to do is to make adjustments to their project constraints, if necessary. A quality plan can increase the scope, the cost, or the time for the project completion in any number of ways, so a review of this is essential. Right, there's our quality plan. We want all aspects of the project to be of the highest quality they can be, and the quality plan is here to ensure that this is exactly what we achieve. Excellent. Now that we've tackled quality, resources, timing, and scope, it seems that we've covered everything, right? Well, as Murphy's Law says, anything that can go wrong, will. So the next crucial thing to talk about is how a project manager identifies risks and plans for their prevention or resolution. See you there.